All right, so this week, I encourage you to, to pray. As whatever it is that just triggers that thought, pray for them this week. Uh, and uh, maybe make a note. And it's, uh, it's the reason that I stand here today. Um, when I was in youth group here at this church long, long ago, uh, when I had some mission trips, and it just started to stir something in me, I saw God moving in the world. And then when I went to college, other trips, and uh, ultimately it's how I ended up back here. I never thought I'd be back here, uh, but I'm just honored to be able to stand here and be a part of what God is doing. Now, some of you are getting really nervous because you're like, Chris, it's 11.26, and you have not started the sermon. And I got to tell you, this sermon is probably a good 30 plus minutes long. And uh, some of you are like, seriously. Others of you are like, we're here. But there's also kids here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause that sermon until next week uh, because I want to give it the space that it needs. Um, And it's something that I want to encourage you um, to do this week is to read Romans chapter 9. And I want to give you just a, a brief preview here of, of what we're going to be talking about so you can start to stir on this. This can be like the mini, mini sermon right here uh, along with a sending reality. Because the fact is, is that we just heard a beautiful sermon from Chris and Sarah. We watched and experienced the beautiful sermon with the gospel being proclaimed here of how it transformed lives and hearing story and witnessing baptism as this picture of death and resurrection. Um, And we have just been filled with the word plus the time of worship and prayer. And so just in the few minutes that we have here, I want to give you a preview of where we're going to go the next couple of weeks here. And the reason I say a preview is because what happens is going through Romans, and maybe you've had this experience, is that in Romans 1, you're like, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Like, it's the power of salvation. And then you get to Romans chapter 2 and 3, like we've been walking through this, and we're in, I think, week 15 of this sermon series, we're about halfway through, that you get to chapters 2 and 3, and you're like, whoa, whoa, humans, man, we're messed up, which I think we just look around and look at the events of our country, and we're like, we have major things that we need to be praying about, and the reality of sin and brokenness in our world. And it says that no one does good, and we've all turned away. We get to chapters 4 and 5, and we're like, oh, wait, there's hope. There is redemption by faith. Paul says we've been justified through faith and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's this beautiful verse. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. And this is how he demonstrated his own love, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Chapter six, we get there and there's this gift from God that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans seven, we get to Paul and it's like, Paul's like, here I am, I'm a mess. And we can relate to Paul. Because Paul is saying things like, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And I think we've all been there. Maybe you're there right now saying, like, I want to do these things, but I do these other things. It's really frustrating. It's the human condition. And Paul is very honest about this. And I love that he says in verse 25 of that chapter, thanks be to God who makes me strong enough to do all really great, brilliant things and and do everything perfectly, right? That's what he says. Not even close. No, he says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. We rest in Jesus. He is the deliverer. Then we get to Romans 8, and this is a powerful, celebratory chapter. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He says that we know that all things work for the good of those who love him who've been called according to his purpose. And I love this next verse. It says, for those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of God. He set forth this knowledge of like, here's humanity, be formed into the image of Jesus. Who might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those he predestined, he called, and those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who's gonna separate us? And so we get to this point where we've walked through these first eight chapters. And it's like, yes, this is great. And then we get to chapters 9, 10, and 11. And we're like, we're just going to skip these chapters, all right? And if you've studied Romans, you know that this is just like, oh, man, what are we getting into? Chapters 9, 10, and 11 talks about maybe the most extensive discussion on God's sovereignty and then human free will. Like, how does that work together? 
if God is sovereign and there's human free will, it seems like there's a tension there. And Paul exists in this tension. And he writes in this tension. And he unpacks what is known as the doctrine of election. Just go read on that a little bit this week. Oh, man, you will go down some rabbit trails with that thing. And really, Paul addresses two key questions. Is how much is God in control of all the events of human history? And then also he asks this question of, does God choose who becomes Christians or followers of Jesus? Or do humans choose themselves? Like, who does the choosing? Is it God chose me? Or did I, did I choose God? And over these three chapters, he's just wrestling with this, and there's all sorts of tension in this. So what happens is people are like, well, I'm just going to skip over this part of Scripture. I'm going to skim over it and just pretend I know what it says. Or just put a giant question mark next to it and just say, meh. I don't know. Or you can get into giant debates about this. I mean, people love to debate this, which then creates all sorts of division. And maybe you've been a part of debates and division over these chapters. But what I want you to know is that like, as we walk through this, there's, there's part of me that hopes you walk away with more questions than answers. Seriously. Because I want you to wrestle. I want you to be like, what does Scripture say? Not what, what does this denomination or what does this theologian or what does this book say or what does this article say? What does Scripture say? What is Paul getting at? How does this fit in the overall theme of what this redemptive work that's happening throughout the entire whole of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation? And there is no way we can resolve this in multiple 30-minute formats. And maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, I know the right answer. Well, good for you. That's awesome. <laughs> I don't. And I'm going to be very, very clear in this. Because what Paul does is, is Paul doesn't err far over in this side. And he doesn't err far over in this side. He walks this line saying, is it possible that both can exist at the same time? Is it possible that God's mind is greater than our mind? Is it possible that God's will is greater than our will? Is it okay that there is mystery when it comes to salvation? A couple of weeks ago, I talked about how I don't understand salvation. I do not. Because whether it's here or VBS or a class or you're sitting with someone or whatever it may be, is two people can hear the exact same thing and one person is weeping, repenting, like, I'll do anything. I'll follow you, Jesus, to the ends of the earth. And the other person is like, let's go to lunch, right? I mean, is there this mystery that we can exist within where there is God's will unfolding and my will unfolding, and somehow they, like, commingle together? And there's this mysterious reality. This is what Paul's trying to, to get across here. He's trying to work through. And so this is what I want you to wrestle with this week. Is the first couple of verses that Andrew spoke on last week in Romans chapter 9. If you have a Bible, we're going to look at these, these first, what, two, three, four verses. I'm going to read them, give you one thought. We're going to pray, and we're going to be out of here today. But this is what I want you to wrestle with. Is that maybe for you, this has been an academic intellectual exercise when it comes to verse, or chapters 9, 10, and 11. Maybe you love to argue and debate these things, and maybe you feel like you win some of these and you lose some. I don't think this is what Paul's intent is. Andrew spoke on these verses last week, and, and this is the framing for where we're going here. Is this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 1. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people Israel. Theirs is the adoption of sonship, theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, the promises, theirs are the patriarchs, and from them traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. I want you to notice this. Paul doesn't start as an academic exercise, not an intellectual argument. He starts with an ache. Everything he's going to say in these next number of chapters starts with an ache. He says, I would lose my own salvation. I would hand my own salvation over if 
how people would know Jesus, if they would see Jesus. And so for you, when you engage Scripture this week and in the past, is it about knowledge or is it about the person that you'll see at the store or tomorrow at work or when you go out to eat or you drive by or you wave at in your neighborhood? Is it about knowing certain things or is it about this applied reality? Do you have that ache? So when we study this over the next number of weeks, do you have that ache? Do you have a name? Do you have a face? We've talked about having a one here in this church. Who is that person? They're not a project. Someone you love, that you pray for, that you invest in. You pray that they would see Jesus as you know Jesus. So church, may may we have that ache, that longing that others around us would know Jesus, but know the beautiful Jesus that we know. So would you allow me to pray? Jesus, we thank you for the word. We thank you for this letter that Paul penned so long ago. Lord, thank you for his words. Thank you for his intellect, which you used, God, to give us the opportunity to share. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for the knowledge of salvation, but we thank you for the practical reality of salvation, the life transformation, the relationship with God, you through Jesus. And so this week, I pray that you would increase our trust, our faith, as we look at the word, as we walk through life. God, it would intertwine. Lord, you're working and are working. Jesus, that we would ache for the people around us, that they would know you that we'd be intentional in, in sharing you in the way we love one another, the way we care for one another, our generosity. God, send us as a people who really do reflect you, who reflect Jesus. And so, Father, I thank you for uh, the beautiful morning, God, that we've had to worship you, to celebrate these three baptisms, to hear the work that you did in Florida and you're continuing to do around this country. I thank you that you are a living God who is alive and active. So God, send us, each and every one of us, God, from this place with your joy, with your peace, God, with your spirit. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.